All right, good morning, everybody. We are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for our webinar on adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs and trauma-informed care. My name is Elizabeth Fries, and I am an outreach coordinator at the Human Services Center and I'm working with the Mom Valley Providers Council this year. Um, so the Mom Valley Providers Council, also known as the MVPC, is a council of about 70 member agencies that work together to identify and address gaps in services in the Mon Valley. Um, so the MVPC working groups on health and youth work together to provide this webinar today as a way to equip fellow providers with the skills necessary to support the people you serve. Um, especially in a time of great stress and uncertainty in our country and in the world. Um, so we are joined today by Megan Schroeder from, Me Megan Schroeder from PAR, um, who will speak with us about what ACEs are, as well as Erin Trout from the Sprout Center, who will speak about trauma-informed care and building trauma-informed programming. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar please stay on mute throughout the presentation. Feel free to util utilize the chat throughout the webinar. If you have questions, you can put them in there and we will be sure to get to them. Um, and there will be time for questions and discussion at the end where you're welcome to unmute and talk, but until that time, please stay muted. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce you to Megan. Megan Schroeder is a licensed social worker and supervises the victim response team with PAR. In her role, Megan oversees victim advocacy services and several pilot programs, including work with incarcerated survivors at Allegheny County Jail and a resilience-based program for girls in out-of-home placement. Um, so I just want to thank both Megan and Erin for joining us. Um, and with that, Megan, you're welcome to take it away. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we're really happy to be here this morning, too. And I was hoping um, one of our advocates could join us as well. So you might see a surprise appearance from her in a little bit if she's able to make it. Um, and her name is Willa Campbell. Otherwise, we'll just be stuck with me for this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. Um, and I do, as Elizabeth said, I do have the chat box open as well. Um, so please feel free um, to pop in there if you have a question um, or if there's something that you want me to elaborate a little bit more on. Um, you know, I think just in the limitations of time, I always say I'm not going to overpack um, our presentations and then I always do it. Um, so I think the hope is just to kind of give you a broad overview of some things today, along with some resources in case you're interested in more information. Um, but you'll also have my contact information. And I'm more than happy to talk more in depth about anything that we go through today if we just don't quite have the time to get to it. Elizabeth, is everything okay with my PowerPoint on your end? Yes, looks good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so as Elizabeth mentioned, um, I work with PAR, which is Pittsburgh Action Against Rape. Um, so we are the designated rape crisis center for Allegheny County. Um, we've been providing services here for about 46 years. Um, all of our services are confidential and are available at no cost to the community. Um, and we work in sexual-based trauma. Um, so regardless of how the age of the survivor, regardless of their gender, gender identity, the type of sexual violence that they experience, um, we're working in kind of that sexual-based trauma. Um, so for today, you'll hear me reference that a little bit, but we're going to keep it a little bit more broad to just experiences of trauma kind of in general. Um, and before we hop into ACEs, I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about what trauma is. And we can all be kind of on the same page with our definition of trauma. Um, so just like we know that people are unique, um, trauma is the same. Um, it's a very unique individual experience, um, which means that no two traumas are going to look the same for people. Um, we at PAR, of course, talk about trauma in the context of sexual violence. Um, but with the definition that you see on your screen, of course, you could take this and apply it to many experiences that people have throughout their lifetime. Um, and what you see is just how the DSM um, talks about trauma and what that clinical definition might look like. Um, so the important thing I think to pull out of there is that there's this um, witnessing or confronting something that is threatening, right? So it may or may not involve death, but certainly something that that invokes fear, um, that makes someone feel like they might be in danger. 
Um, and the important part here is this intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Um, and so to know that just that's part of that unique response to trauma is that you could have two people who experience very similar traumatic incidents, but have very different responses to them. Um, so it's important that we don't try to create this kind of hierarchy of trauma where we're ranking what might be more traumatic or less traumatic, um, because we know that it really does depend on that individual person and how they're responding in that moment. Um, so at PAR, like we tend to see some survivors of trauma who do experience some of those like classic trauma symptoms, um, while others don't. Um, and that that's okay. Um, but as we approach our work as providers, that we really need to be looking at that individual in front of us and how they are responding to the trauma and not kind of what we would expect to see, if that makes sense. And one of the other kind of important distinctions in trauma is this understanding between acute and complex. Um, so that you can see the DSM definitions are there, um, but I wanted to break this down a little bit. Um, if we think about kind of a one-time isolated incident of trauma, that's what we tend to call acute trauma. So something like a car accident, right, that it takes place one time. Um, often what we're seeing in children or in families, um, especially in sexual trauma, is trauma that's categorized more as a complex trauma. Um, so this would be something that is prolonged exposure to a traumatic incident, um, to trauma that takes place um, multiple times, um, or trauma that takes place like in the context of a relationship. Um, so you think about a lot of the traumatic experiences that our clients have, often they are kind of embedded in the family relationship. Um, and so even if you do have like a one-time incident of trauma, the fact that it's happening within the context of those relationships could be enough to consider that complex trauma. Um, and that becomes really important when we're thinking about how people are reacting and responding to the trauma that they've experienced. Um, and you can also see that when we think about complex trauma, we tend to categorize trauma that happens in childhood um, as complex as well. Um, and that's what we're going to spend most of today talking about is kind of why that happens. So then what does trauma look like or how does it present itself in someone? Um, we know that when someone experiences trauma, our brains aren't really processing that information or that event the same way that it would with non-traumatic information. Um, often that means that our brains are kind of numbing or shutting down like our normal emotional response. Um, and it's important to know um, what that might look like um, with an individual who's in front of you, because of course we know that they're often not coming and saying, you know, I've experienced complex trauma and I need help with managing my symptoms, um, right? But as providers, it's important for us to know how trauma presents itself. And that's what you see here, just a couple of examples of what, what that might look like. Um, we know one of the most prevalent responses to trauma is this inability to regulate emotion. Um, which really just means that like, big emotions are normal and common. Um, someone might be experiencing emotions that aren't the norm for them. They might kind of swing back and forth between emotions really quickly, or they just have an emotion that's normal for them, but their response is much more heightened, so it comes out of that kind of big emotion. Um, and we do tend to see, I think, anger and aggression is kind of a go-to for a lot of our trauma survivors. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you more about what that means if you're interested in that. Um, we also have this emotional numbing, um, right, or having a really flat affect, um, feeling disconnected um, from your emotions, not being able to recognize or identify what your emotions are. Um, feeling isolated um, or kind of unstable in your relationships, right, is something else we know from trauma theory, um, that trauma really impacts the way a person understands their relationships to others and their ability to feel secure or to form connections with people. Um, the unhealthy coping skills, right, that people find a way to feel better. Um, if you're experiencing symptoms or emotions that are not your norm, um, you're going to find a way to make yourself feel better. Um, and often that comes out in coping skills that we might consider to be harmful or unhealthy. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then the way that our brain even processes and stores traumatic information is vastly different than how it stores non-traumatic information. So it's really common to see survivors who don't have a complete memory of their trauma, um, who might have gaps, or who have memories that are not linear, right? So they don't go A to Z, they're kind of all over the place and it's hard to put them in chronological order. And this shows you so a little bit more specifically to child sexual abuse and sexual assault. 
um, in adults, um, some of the most common symptoms that our survivors report experiencing. Um, so you have this study down there if you're interested in looking more at this, um, but this was a meta-analysis that was done with survivors who reported to emergency departments within a few days of sexual-based trauma. And what they found is that 45% of all survivors reported at least some symptoms following their traumatic experience. And then you can see like the percentage of each specific symptom kind of broken down here. Um, so I think two things are really critical when we think about this. Um, one is that it's really important to normalize like how common it is for survivors to experience trauma symptoms. Um, at PAR, we often talk with people who don't quite make that connection, that they might come in and say, like, I just don't feel like myself. I feel like I'm crazy. Like, just everything in my world is kind of upside down. And they don't always make that connection back to, it's because of this traumatic thing that happened to me and what I'm actually going through are symptoms of that. Um, so to be able to give people language for that and normalize, that, like, this isn't something that's wrong with you. Like, you definitely are not crazy. Like, this is a symptom of your trauma, which means then that we know how to help you manage it. Um, when we can kind of attach that language to it. And the other really important thing here um, is to know that a lot of trauma symptoms tend to manifest themselves as mental health conditions. Um, so as providers, it's really important that we can make that connection, right, between some of the things that we're seeing and the, this um, traumatic experience that our client may have had, um, especially here with suicidality. Um, I'll say this research um, was done in 2017, but it wasn't released until last year. Um, so it was like summer of 2019 before a lot of victim services really had access to this. Um, and I will say that piece was very surprising for us, um, that we certainly talk about suicidality as providers, but I had no idea that that was the most common symptom that would have been reported by survivors. And so to have that on our radar um, becomes really important for safety planning with the clients that we're working with as well. Okay, so we're going to shift gears just a little bit um, from trauma into thinking about what trauma looks like um, as it kind of unfolds across the lifespan. Um, and I like to use a socio-ecological model for that. If any of you have a social work background, you're probably familiar with this. Um, but even if you don't, I think this is just a really helpful way to conceptualize what we're talking about. Um, is that when we talk about trauma, we tend to focus on this experience that one individual person had and then the symptoms that, they're, that they have and how we can help manage those things. But it's really important not to overlook kind of the root underlying causes of trauma and some of those other things that might be happening in that person's life that are really critical to think about. Um, and so it's important then that we think about our individual clients not as existing in kind of this vacuum, but rather as individuals who exist in the context of relationships, who live in communities, and who exist in our broader society. Um, and when we do that, we kind of get a better picture of some of the things that might really be underlying that trauma. So like for example, with sexual-based trauma, we know that often um, there's a cycle of childhood sexual abuse um, that exists between generations in families. Um, we also know that sexual trauma is rooted in gender-based violence and in oppression, right? So having this socio-ecological model helps us just get a clearer picture of really what we're talking about when we look at trauma. I'm just going to check. It looks like we don't have any questions so far, so I'm going to keep rolling um, into our ACE study. Um, and I will say, like, this could probably be an entire day training all by itself, um, but there are really incredible resources around this if it's something that you're interested in. So today we're going to do just a very broad overview of it, um, but again, I'm happy to talk with you more about anything that you're interested in and get you some resources. Um, so those of you who, um, many of you probably are already familiar with the ACE study, um, those of you who aren't, um, this is... What makes the ACE study unique um, is that it's one of the largest studies that was ever done um, around health disparities. Um, so you can see here that they had close to 18,000 participants, which really is incredible for a research study. Um, the ACE study actually originated um, with a doctor who was studying obesity in adult women. Um, and when he was doing that research, he recognized this link um, between obesity and early experiences he considered to be traumatic in the women's lives. So he kind of created this concept of negative health outcomes, with obesity as his example, that were actually linked to um, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, right, which we would consider to be child trauma. Um, and when this research was published, I think it really became a way for service providers 
and communities to help conceptualize the impact of trauma across our lifespan. Um, and when I think about the ACE study and some of the results, I think no one was really surprised when we saw them. Like as providers who do this work, everyone was kind of like, yeah, like that makes sense. But it really was the first time that we had like formal research to attach to what everyone kind of knew as providers and what they were seeing in their communities. So what you see here on the left side of your screen, these are those um, eight ACEs um, or areas of dysfunction that he identified, right? So things like witnessing or experiencing physical abuse, witnessing domestic violence in the home, being sexually abused, having a household member in prison, um, having substance abuse in the home, having untreated mental health in the home or death of a parent, right? So he really focused on just those eight kind of areas of childhood trauma. And then he also looked at 10 health risk factors, and that's what you see here. Um, so obesity, which was his original research, um, and adding things like smoking, depression, suicidality, alcoholism, um, injected drug use, right? So these are, um, we take our eight ACEs or areas of dysfunction, and we're trying to look at how that might impact 10 different health risk factors across someone's lifespan. Um, so for the people who participated in the ACE study, what you see on your screen almost became like a checklist. So for each of these eight areas of dysfunction that someone had experienced, they would add a check mark and that would be scored for them, um, which adds basically a point to their ACE study. Um, and what the researchers were able to do then is to correlate the points that the participants were getting against some of the health risk factors that they were able to see in that person's life. Um, one of the really striking results from the study is just how common it was for people to have those ACEs in their lifetime. Um, what the study found was that 60% of the population they surveyed had at least one of these areas of dysfunction, um, and that almost 13% had four or more of those, right? So that's a pretty good number. We're talking about 70% um, of our research population had at least one traumatic experience in their childhood. And then what happened from there is the researchers formed what they considered this kind of dose response relationship um, between those ACEs and health outcomes. And the way they did that was by making this triangle, which if you're familiar with the ACE study, you've probably seen this before. So what this triangle really helped us to see um, was exactly that impact of early childhood experiences and trauma as it unfolded across the participant's lifespan. Um, so what you see here, um, is that this adverse childhood experience exists, so whether this was one or four or seven, whatever that person had, um, that people find ways to cope with those things, like I said earlier, right? Like when you don't feel well, you find a way to make yourself feel better and to manage your symptoms. Um, the ACE study called those things social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, um, but that's really what we would think of as a symptom of trauma. Um, and then also what the ACE study did um, is they talked about how then do people deal with that impairment. Um, the language the ACE study used was what you see in kind of that pink layer or the adoption of health risk behaviors. Um, as a provider, we tend to talk about that as coping skills, right? So um, adoption of health risk behaviors could just be a way that someone is managing and responding to their symptoms or their coping behavior. Um, what the ACE study recognized is that often their participants were choosing what they considered to be negative or harmful ways to cope, which is why they talk about it with the language of health risk behaviors. Um, and then those things then were leading to disease, disability, and social problems, and the ACE study linked some of those things to an earlier death. Okay, so you look kind of as a broad picture that we have our early experiences in trauma, we have people who are reacting and experiencing symptoms from that trauma. They're developing coping skills to help manage those symptoms, which then might lead to things like disease and disability or social problems, and then could be connected to an earlier death. Um, so this really, like I said, was the first time that like informal research, like providers were able to see that those early experiences in childhood didn't just exist in a vacuum, that they really did carry over across someone's lifespan and that they had real tangible outcomes to them. And the other really important finding from the ACE study um, was this idea of cumulative trauma, um, right? So again, I think that's something that's kind of innate in our work that many providers recognize that, um, that often trauma comes along with other trauma. Um, but the ACE study was really able to attach some concrete numbers and research to that concept. 
Um, and so what they did was they looked at participants who had one single isolated event of trauma compared to those who had a much higher score or multiple incidents of trauma. Um, and what they found is that as someone's ACE score increased, right, so as they had more trauma, um, their health outcomes also worsened. Um, a couple of examples they were able to show someone who had an ACE score of four, um, their risk of developing pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone who had an ACE score of zero. Um, for someone with an ACE score of four, um, the likelihood of developing depression was four and a half times higher, um, and suicidality was 12 times higher, right? So what this really did was help us recognize that cumulative nature of trauma, right? That once trauma happens, that we know people are more at risk developing additional traumatic experiences, and that that does have an impact on their health and well-being then across their lifespan. Um, in sexual trauma specifically, um, we talk about this concept as like re-victimization. Um, we know from research on sexual assault um, that two out of three people who experience sexual abuse or assault will re-experience some form of victimization in their lifetime. Um, we also know from that research that childhood sexual abuse doubles someone's risk of re-experiencing it. Um, so to see re-victimization in like sexual-based trauma is incredibly common, especially when we're talking about children who have experienced sexual abuse. So then one thing um, I will say, the ACE study was a groundbreaking um, and is really important in its own right. Um, but there are also some pretty clear issues um, with the pool of participants who were in the ACE study. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that and share another resource with you. Um, so what you can see here is what those 18,000 participants kind of looked like. 75% um, of them are white and 75% of them were college educated. Um, and so while it's really great that they had 18,000 participants in this study, like we know that this really is not an accurate depiction of what our communities or our country looks like. Um, and so there was this really interesting study that came out um, in 2019, so this is fairly recent, um, from Philadelphia. Um, it basically was kind of a redo of the ACE study. Um, so Philadelphia pulled together this thing called the Philadelphia ACE Project in 2012. Um, and what they wanted to do was to take the ACE study and replicate it in their community, but fill in some of those gaps that kind of existed within the ACE study. Um, and one of those was having much more diversity embedded in their pool of participants. Um, so this was a much smaller study. Um, they had around 1,700 people. But what you can see is that they really made an effort to make sure that the urban area of Philadelphia was more inclusive in this, and that it also is a more inclusive representation of what this would look like nationwide, right? Um, so they had 43% of their participants who were Black, 44% who were White, and 41% who had at least some high school education here. Um, so what happened is this Philadelphia ACE project pulled together this roughly 2,000 participants, um, and they looked at those eight areas of dysfunction that had been included in the original ACE study. And what they realized is that a lot of those things really existed at like the individual level, right? Um, but if this is where our socio-ecological model becomes really important, is thinking about there are things beyond just that individual's experience that can be traumatic in their life. And so how do we pull in family risk factors or community risk factors in thinking about how those things might increase trauma or impact a child throughout their lifetime as well? Um, and so what they did is they added five additional ACEs um, to what, so over here you see those conventional the eight, and then they added their own five, which they considered to be these expanded ACEs. Um, what I really like about those is that these expanded ACEs really are in that community level, right? So we're talking about things like witnessing violence in your community, um, living in foster care, um, experiencing bullying, experiencing racism or discrimination, um, and feeling unsafe in your neighborhood. Um, and just like the original ACE study, the Philadelphia Project found that the vast majority of their participants had experienced at least one ACE. Um, in Philadelphia, they found that 40% of their participants had at least four ACEs. Okay. And then what they did was they made this really great pyramid. 
not that I don't like the original East period, it was good. Um, but I just think this is a much more comprehensive look um, at what's really happening in people's lives. So I just kind of want to show you what adjustments they made to the pyramid, um, specifically around some of those community level indicators. Um, so one of the first things that they did um, is they added the bottom two layers that you see here. So the social local context and then this generational embodiment or historical trauma. Right. So this first one um, that we know, this is that trauma that's intergenerational or has passed down between generations of families. Social local context. Um, this is where we're thinking about a person as they exist in society. Um, and the role that oppression and discrimination will play in compounding a traumatic experience that that person has, right? So the Philadelphia Project was able to look at those community level indicators, but then also think about community violence um, and how things like poverty or racism or living in an unsafe neighborhood might also contribute to trauma. Um, and then the rest of these um, are pretty similar to the original study, but just with a few little tweaks. Um, so you can see, um, instead of having the language of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, they consider this to be complex trauma, right? Which we talked about earlier is they recognize that their participants often did not just have one isolated incident of trauma. That what we are seeing is prolonged exposure to trauma, um, trauma that was happening in families or trauma that happened really early in life and affected a child's development. They also added this idea of allostatic load, um, which you might be familiar with. They also talk about as being toxic stress. Um, and I have a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but this is where they kind of replace that language of social and emotional cognitive impairment, right? So they're talking about it more like toxic stress and less as an impairment that the individual had. Um, they renamed this adoption of health risk behaviors became coping skills, right? Which is what we know, um, that people adopt risky or unhealthy behaviors because they need a way to help manage their symptoms and to feel better, and that we know those as coping skills. Um, and then they added up here, this language of symptoms of disease, distress, or criminalization, um, that often what we're seeing is that not a symptom of a disease, like the ACE study was talking about, but more when some of our unhealthy coping skills go unchecked or untreated, um, that it can lead to things like disease or distress or even criminalization. Um, you know, when we have systems or services that will take a punitive approach to people who are just reacting to their trauma and not always recognizing, right, that this is a trauma symptom that they're seeing. They kept early death up here. Um, and then over on the side, um, this is where the original ACE study had some scientific gaps. Um, that the Philadelphia Project filled in as microaggressions and implicit bias. Um, there's some really incredible reading on this um, that I have included at the end of the slides in case you want to look at that. Um, but basically what the Philadelphia Project was saying is that in their participants, they recognized that looking at this triangle alone is not enough. Um, that we have to consider the role that things like implicit bias or microaggressions have on people as they're navigating the world. And that that impact is actually that it's creating trauma and then compounding the trauma that people are already experiencing. And so it was important to consider that in the experience that someone might have. Okay, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but I just wanted to briefly mention this, um, that some of you have that book, The Deepest Well. Um, that there's also a really great TED talk by Dr. Nadine Burke um, that looks specifically at how those early experiences and trauma changes the way that our brains develop, right? Um, and specifically, I would encourage you to look at the fight, flight, and freeze response um, because it really does show this connection between early trauma and how a child's brain will develop and then impact them across their lifetime. And just kind of the last thing um, that comes out of this Philadelphia ACE project is this concept of toxic stress, right? That we know that like not all stress is bad. As humans in the world, we experience stress every single day. Um, stress helps us develop problem solving skills. It helps boost our resilience. It gives us protective factors. Um, but we also know that having prolonged exposure to stress or having exposure to extreme stress can be very harmful. And that's where this concept of toxic stress comes in. Um, so if you read through this, what it really tells you um, is that toxic stress does impact like a child's ability to think, to learn, to grow, to relate to others, right? So many of the things that we know from trauma theory, but that that has an effect on someone throughout their lifetime, both on their physical and their mental health. 
Okay, um, I'll say I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. Um, but I think it is important, especially when we're thinking about that triangle from the Philadelphia project, to think about as providers how we are recognizing and responding to trauma. And this is where it becomes really critical that we have trauma informed care in place. Um, and I know Erin is going to talk more about that. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but this will be in your resources for you um, is to think about really when our systems are or our services are not equipped to really recognize trauma um, or to promote healing, what happens then to our children throughout their lifetime. And then to kind of wrap up, I wanted to point out this piece of toxic stress um, that kind of provides a little bit of hope, like after all of that information, especially jam-packed in 30 minutes, um, that there is a little bit of hope and some positivity in this too, um, is what we know from the research on toxic stress is this last sentence, which I highlighted for you, um, which is having access to nurturing and supportive relationships with adults can help reduce the damage that's caused by early toxic stress. So just by being, right, a healthy, relatively well-adjusted normal adult in a child's life um, that you are helping to reduce some of the damage that's caused by their early experiences in child or by their toxic stress. Um, and there's this metaphor that I really like for that um, about plants, right? So if you're a house plant person, you know that they can be very difficult to take care of, right? But when we do it well, there are benefits that come along with it, right? Um, so if we water our plants, we have to repot them when they get too big. We have to make sure they have the right exposure to light. Um, when we do all of those things correctly, right, we're rewarded with these plants that really function well um, and they clean the air in our space. Um, so as providers, we kind of become like those house plants, right, for the children or the clients who exist in our lives. Um, when we can help promote resilience and help promote healing and just be present with them, um, we're kind of acting like those plants and purifying some of that toxic stress that exists for them. Um, so, and this comes from an article that I included in your resources that I just think is really great um, about taking trauma-informed care and thinking about how to infuse what we know um, about some of those community level indicators and how to promote healing um, among people in kind of a different way. Um, so you have that on here. That's that last article, The Future of Healing. Erin, I feel like I just talked nonstop for 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> um, but then I will be here um, for questions as well once Erin is done. Thank you so much, Megan. That was some really helpful information. Um, so I just want to introduce you guys to Erin Trout. Um, she is the owner of the Sprout Center for Emotional Growth and Development. Um, and they focus on supporting children and their families around trauma, attachment, and other stressors. So Erin, go ahead. Great. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you guys for having me. I'm going to try to figure out how to share a screen here. Can you guys see it? Ta-da! Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am so glad to be here. And Megan, I, I was like, yeah, going along with your points, because I really, um, you know, I had this, this mixed feeling about, okay, we're talking about ACEs, and we're learning so much more now with the Philadelphia study and bridging not only, okay, now I know what to do with it, or now I know what it is, what do I do with it? Um, so in bringing that together, um, a lot of my work focuses on children and families. A lot of the work that I also do is dyadic work, right? Children within their, their family system. Because we also know that if we're working with children who've experienced these ACEs and this toxic stress, we also have parents who've experienced ACEs and toxic stress. So in some cases, right, these thing, terrible things can happen to one individual. But when we're talking about a family system, it's happening to everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about how we could take a look at this and also support it within our agencies. And how we support it within ourselves as well to be trauma-informed. So of course, the first step in supporting trauma is stop saying, what's wrong with this person? And then ask, who is this person? What have they experienced? What do they believe is true? What has happened to them? Right, so we see these things that are going on or we've been working with some families. I know a lot of you do a lot of extensive work. You've been doing this work for quite some time. And there's these things that you're going, Ah, right. There's something in me that's pulling through here that I'm feeling like, what is wrong with this person? Why isn't this happening? Or why, you know, when I'm throwing out all the tips and tricks, 
what is getting in the way. And I think trauma might be a kind of tip into that. So trauma changes the way that we see the world and we take in our sensory info, right? It hijacks your brain. It's toxic stress. Toxic stress in young children, babies even, and we're even still looking at what this means in our utero. Um, you know, it changes the way that you take in sensory information, right? If I have experienced a really stressful home life, somebody just, you know, raising their voice is going to hit me different than it hits another person who's never experienced that. It changes the way that I'm going to learn. We know that folks who've experienced a lot of trauma and toxic stress, their problem solving skills are poor. So we say things like, we do things like having, you know, financial seminars and, you know, how to get folks out of debt and then tax time comes around and then they spend their money on these big screen TVs and we're going, what? wait a minute, we talked about this. But we're understanding that in sometimes this trauma situation, trauma doesn't think ahead. You do anything to feel better in that moment. So by doing that, you know, trauma doesn't think about down the road. Trauma happens now. And if I can alleviate this stress now, I'm going to do that. I like to call this the puppy principle, right? How many of you guys have worked with families and you're going into homes and things like that? And then you, everything seems to be falling apart. You're trying to get this family back on track and supporting them and doing so. And you show up and there's a brand new puppy, right? If I handed you a puppy in our group now, everybody would feel instantly better. And I'm thinking about COVID puppies now too, right? The stress is increased. I'll do anything to decrease that stress. And trauma will make you do anything to decrease your stress. It doesn't allow you to think forward. It impacts the way that you interact with others. And it definitely impacts the way that you, the quality of your relationships that you do have, right? We often find that folks who've experienced toxic stress and trauma also have difficulty within relationships, right? This is the discussion that we have about, you know, how do we help you find somebody that's good for you, right? We know that these experiences with folks who've gotten into toxic relationship after toxic relationship, right? It feels normal, different feels awkward. Can you think about experiencing trauma and the minute you try something that's different for you, even though it might be good for you, right? Your brain's going, wait a minute, that's not normal. Get back to normal. So you can see how this pattern, trauma keeps you stuck in where you are. So I'll talk a little bit about SAMHSA's key principles around being trauma-informed. First and foremost is safety, not only physical safety, but emotional safety. And we have to check in often around this. If your agency is working towards being a trauma-informed agency, right, or you're providing trauma-informed principles, safety is paramount. Without safety, the whole thing falls apart. So what are we doing to create that safety? Do I have um, places that folks actually feel safe and comfortable, right? Am I also making that space to share what is difficult and not judge, right? That what is wrong with you, what has happened to you, switch. Is there trustworthiness and transparency, right? So these decisions, these directions are built openly. So we're treatment planning together. We're pulling what support service, uh, services that you want in. What is going to help you at this moment? And there's also support and self-help, right? So we're being supportive, building small attainable goals. I'm not going to say this is where you're going to go and set you up for failure, right? So a lot of goal planning goes into this too. You know, how am I going to get you here? So of course, we also know that a lot of our agencies support, we work with folks who've experienced trauma and toxic stress, but we also have to be mindful that those whom we work with have also experienced trauma and toxic stress. We can all look at these ACEs and tick off a few of them, right? Some of us more than others. But it's helpful to be mindful that not only it's in the work that we do, it's how we nurture our own agencies as well to support um, trauma-informed care. So again, collaboration partnering, level of power, right? We're understanding that I am not the person that's here to save you. I'm here to collaborate with you and provide the best possible experience for you to move forward, right? I want to help you, right? And I want to help with you. I'm not going to make it happen for you in the way that I think it's going to happen. I want to collaborate. 
empowerment voice and choice is huge. Not only does that create safety, if we think about um, going back to Megan's um, piece there, you know, suicidality is huge, but there's also anxiety and stress in there. When we have anxiety, we like to control things, right? We want to know how things happen. Wow, can that decrease my anxiety if I feel empowered and I have choice in what's going on here? And it builds upon the strengths. And of course, cultural acknowledgement, right? So we have to move past those stereotypes and biases. We have to offer gender responsive services and also make sure that, you know, what we've used traditionally may not be working. And we have to recognize historical trauma as well. Um, we have to make sure that all folks who are working within, you know, implicit bias training is needing to be paramount here if we're going to say we're trauma informed. We have to have this information and make sure that everybody is on the same page with what's going on here. The difficult thing about this is that we're often strengths based, right? We're always making positive goals and moving towards positive outcomes. However, we're in a deficit based system, right? You have to qualify for needs, right? So I'm thinking about early intervention services. In order to serve the child, they have to have a 25% delay. In many of our mental health um, places, you have to have a mental health diagnosis in order for me to serve you. So it really takes a shift on how to say, you know, sure, I want to be strengths-based, but we also have to notice that there's some deficits here that have led you to our door. Um, and that's not the defining factor in who you are. Um, it's just the gateway to how we get those services in place. So I'm going to offer up some four R's of trauma-informed care, and then I'm going to add three more to this. Um, so realize, we got to realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand those paths for recovery, right? So today, we learned some information about the ACEs and we realize that this impacts a wide group of people and that we're not immune to this either. We need to recognize the signs and symptoms in trauma in clients, families, ourselves, others involved with the system. Responding. Right? So we are fully integrating that knowledge about trauma. We're putting it into our policies, our procedures, and our practices. And I also want to add to this that this, you know, not responding isn't just responding to you in a compassionate response, but advocacy is also huge here. We're responding to everybody in the sense of saying, hey, this is, you know, I may not be talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, but hey, I'm responding in an advocacy kind of opportunity. And of course, resisting re-traumatization. When you know better, you do better. So we know what things, being aware of trauma allows us to understand. And when we know that, you know, trauma is in the eye of the beholder, we're not going to say, well, that's not trauma to you. We're going to recognize what that is and we're going to resist your re-traumatization. So I'm going to add three more to this. Relationships, resilience, and reflection. So of course, relationships. Your relationship is going to be the best prevention strategy. Your relationship is so important, right? And we say relationships and we think, oh, well, we can't get close to these folks. Well, we have to. We have to recognize that in our space and time and working with the folks that we work with and within our agencies together, that we have a relationship here and it needs to be safe. It needs to be supportive it's gonna increase support and understanding. So making sure that we're you know, interacting as well. Thinking about right now, the COVID crisis as well, how much have we been disconnected for our relationships and we have a longing for that? And then noticing that when you're not in those regular routines of relationships, that this feels really, really hard. So your relationship is huge. Your relationship is the place where safety can occur. Your relationship is where that empowerment occurs and that advocacy starts. So focusing on, you know, what does that mean to have a relationship with somebody else, right? So I'm often brought back to this piece of empathy, right? So what does it mean if I show up for somebody, right? If you have a good relationship with somebody, right, you felt this, or you felt this connection with them. I think of it too in terms of, Teachers, if you think back to teachers that you've had across your lifespan, you're not going to sit there and say, wow, my math teacher was instrumental in my life because they taught me a lot of really good math skills. 
No, you might say this person really saw who I was and really nurtured my talents, right? That's what you are. It's not what you can teach a person. It's how they felt when they are within your presence. So empathy involves your eye contact, your muscles of the face, posture, affect, tone of voice, hearing the whole person, and of course your response. Or your response may not be something verbal. It might just be your presence in that response. And thinking about how difficult this might be to convey right now, particularly since we've been in the online system here. But if we're leading with love and empathy, we're understanding that we're open to having relationships with the folks um, that we serve. You do not have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. Some of us are therapists. Some of us are incredibly therapeutic. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, you know, folks might say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't need a therapist. Well, therapeutic work, sometimes in just allowing folks to share their trauma story or share the struggles that go through them is so helpful in building that relationship and supporting that. So everyone needs to understand what it means to be trauma-informed. So if you're thinking about the agencies with which you work in, where folks, you know, used to come into the office or the communities that you serve, everybody needs to be trauma-informed. So everybody right down from those therapists to the administration, to that you know, secretarial staff, right when you walk in the door, somebody needs to be trauma-informed, right down to those folks who are also, you know, if you think about support staff, IT departments, everybody needs to understand what it means to be trauma-informed. It's also this piece of resilience. I caution this word because we use it a lot, particularly when we talk about children and their response to stress and trauma. But we say, oh, they're resilient. But my biggest warning for this is that, you know, resilience does not happen in a vacuum. Any story of resilience and hope that you've heard about doesn't happen with that person climbing out of whatever hole it was by themselves. Resilience is in the context of support. We cannot do this alone. So recognizing that resilience is possible, but only when that safety support people are there. So trauma-informed work is not assuming that somebody has resilience and hoping that it works out for the best. Trauma-informed work is being present and offering that support, even in those days where you go, here we go again, right? The third time that I've offered this same resource. But resilience is something that does not happen alone. Trauma will also shake this. Trauma and toxic stress might change that brain to go, I don't know how to accept that help in the way that we would hope that somebody would accept that help. But remember what has happened to you and understanding that being trauma-informed means that I know that trauma isn't gonna make you just say, okay, cool, let's do this together. Trauma's gonna make you caution me for a while. And that's safety, that's your brain keeping itself safe. But continuously building upon that relationship to help that person build that resilience, build the ability to trust in those relationships, build the ability to try new things and overcome some of those trauma responses that happen. So biggest thing is resilience doesn't happen alone. Resilience happens in the context of secure, stable relationships with other people. We also have to make sure that we help our helpers. So, you know, I know those of you who are working within this, you know, work really, really hard for many, many years. But if you say that you provide trauma-informed principles, your workplace also has to be trauma-informed. You understand that the folks who have ACEs that we work with, we also have our own ACEs. So we have to make sure that we have a self-defined balance of wellness habits. So they don't always apply to the work that we do, they apply to us in the work that we do. So how are you feeling? Not just what are you doing? It's how is this for you? So we know that an estimated 1 million workers are absent each day just due to stress. And we know how COVID has impacted that as well. So we know that there's, you know, increased stressors and the need for extra supports in place there. So how are we going to help the helpers? And that leads me to the, the R of reflection. You know? Are we offering, you know, not just the self-care, right? We talk about self-care like it's bubble baths and rainbows, and we know that it's a little bit more than that. Are we offering the space for 
our employees, our workers to say, this is really hard and not having that fear of, is this going to show up on a performance evaluation for me? What can I say is really hard in this work? We know also that trauma is a trigger. So if I've experienced a trauma and I have a client or family that I'm working with that is really closely related to my trauma, I might be triggered by that. I need the safety to be able to say, this is too much for me, or I need some extra supports around this. And to also explore what is hard about it, right? When I'm having big feelings about the folks that I'm working with, the folks that I'm working um, to support, let me explore that for a little bit without feeling as though I can't have a safe place to express that. So you can see in offering a safe place for tra folks who've experienced trauma to express what's been hard for them, we also need to do this for our workforce. What is hard within this work? And acknowledge that this is tough work. So some of us get administrative supervision, which is, you know, well, how's my paperwork? Is it in on time? What am I doing? We get clinical supervision. If this happens, then we're to do this. And that's supposed to make it better. But when do we have that time to reflect with others in our work to say, this is tough? And how do I feel about it? And how is the personal and the professional meshing together? And where do I get a safe space for that? So we also have to allow, um, you know, in that vein of self-care, some creative time particularly now when we can't separate work from home. It's all in the same place. So how do we allow for spaces of creative time where we can allow for that reflection to come through? If we're constantly busy and working on behalf of others, you know, we have to take a break from that and work on ourselves. And that allows for us to have more space and time for other folks that we're working with. So reflection is a huge piece of the work that we do as well. Reflection is tough, um, especially when we're constantly going. And reflection to somebody who's experienced trauma might not be easy, right? We may not want to go back there. Um, and that's okay. That's the support that we allow for folks to, to move through. But in order for us to say that we have trauma-informed support and we provide this, we also have to provide it to the helpers. So we have to make sure that our helpers are taken care of, right? It's the Fred Rogers piece of look for the helpers, but I'll add also recognize that the helpers need helpers too. So with that, um, I'll leave it, I'll stop the share here. I think we're at time for questions, thoughts, comments. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was awesome. So um, we do have time to have some questions or thoughts or um, anything that you guys would like to share or ask Megan and Aaron. Um, you are welcome to either unmute yourself and ask it. I would ask that you raise your hand just because we do have a lot of people on. Um, and I don't want everyone talking all at once. Um, but you're also welcome to put your question in the chat if you prefer to do it that way. I will be monitoring that as well. So at this time, um, I'll kick it open to questions. I have a question, actually. Oh, there we go. There's one. All right. Um, what are some strategies to talk with students who mention a traumatic experience but do so very casually or don't want to talk more about it and don't personally see it as traumatic? How can we be supportive without telling them what their experience is? Mm -hmm. Um, Teresa, would you be comfortable exploring this a little bit more? How, when you talk about students, you know, what age student are you talking about? And yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I work primarily with um, high school students, high school seniors, um, and so sometimes we'll just be getting into a conversation uh, about you know what I'm working on them with, which is usually college and career related things. Um, and then it'll just turn to talking about like life experiences and they'll kind of bring up something that's happened 
that um, I recognize is not a great experience, maybe traumatic, maybe just something that um, I'm surprised they have such a casual response with. And I want to um, figure out how to, you know, be supportive of that and maybe um, provide resources if it is something really traumatic. Some of them disclose, you know, really painful things that have happened in their past that, you know, I don't know if they've worked through them or whatever, but I don't want to, you know, tell them like you had trauma, you need help and like assume that's what they want or need. Megan, now um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how we do this together. Teresa, I'm wondering, you know, if this is the teenage casual response of, yeah, yeah, this happened, right? Um, and then I'm going to pull back on the relationship piece and say, I'm wondering if this kid threw out a feeler to say, hey, this happened to me and didn't want a big response because maybe that makes other people fearful and I don't know what I'm going to get if I throw out that big thing. Um, or I'm going to downplay it so that it doesn't become so big for me either. So I'm wondering if the response might be in the relationship to say, hey, you know, what you told me, it's been on my mind. I've been holding you in mind. I've been thinking about you. And I was really wanting to know if you'd like to share more about that sometime. So maybe making the space to say, would we have lunch together? Or um, in a space, you know, allowing that opportunity. So creating that safe space to say, I hold you in mind with the relationship and I'm going to give you the space and time to offer this and wondering where it goes from there. Erin, I agree. I think that relationship piece is so important. Um, that in situations like this, it often comes back to that connection and support, right? That we know that kids will talk when they're ready. They'll seek support when they're ready. And sometimes they're not. Um, I think Erin, like you're like spot on with that, that sometimes it is about like gauging your reaction or even seeing how it feels to like say something out loud. And if we can focus on the connection and support that we can provide to that person and not try to place responsibility on them, like to disclose, there's still a lot of opportunity, right? Um, to work with them, to provide support to them, to be present there for them when they are ready. Um, I'm always a big fan too of just offering resources, <clears throat> whether or not someone needs it or asks for it, so that we're not placing that responsibility on people to have to say, hey, I need this thing, or I've experienced this thing. Um, so maybe thinking about the resources that you have available in your space and how students can access those. Um, I think the only other thing I would add to that is um, in just thinking about how we're being transparent around confidentiality and what our limitations are, especially with that population that you work with, because that can be really tricky, is to make sure that we're setting kids up for success, that they know before they start talking with us, like what that might mean. Yeah, yeah thank you. That was very helpful. And I will definitely use some of that going forward. Yeah. I want to piggyback on, on Megan's piece as well. Um, sometimes what's been helpful is, you know, when you have to refer to other people, right, or you're recognizing that maybe there's something larger here and I need to make those connections for folks to get more intensive support services or other things like that, the relationship is helpful too to say, hey, I know Megan at par and we have this connection. So you trust me and I trust Megan, right? We always go when we're looking for a plumber, right? We're going to try to find somebody that somebody else used and had a, a good experience with. It's the same thing for the support services. So making sure that you have relationships within your connections too, when that time comes to refer and support. All right, our next question is, how does the ACEs work around cultural differences in what is considered normal? Yeah, I would say that when you're looking at kind of the, a lot of the traditional work around ACEs, it doesn't so much account for that. And that's what I think what Erin said is so important is that we're continuing to learn so much like from that original data. And we're starting to see more research like the Philadelphia Project kind of expand on those things. Because um, I really think like that was like one of the big limitations, right, with that original data from the ACE study is it doesn't really consider people in the context of their culture, even in the context of their race or the context of oppression. Um, so that's something that I think we need to be really careful that we're continuing to expand our knowledge like 
around those things and not just relying on some of that original data. All right, um, are there resources and materials to help explain the concept of ACEs to teens in language that they would most easily understand? I have a child complex trauma, ASD, GAD, PTSD. She does well with reading and visual things. I'll show some of the items from the training, but I think the language is more than she would connect with. Um. I'm thinking about the Philadelphia ACEs project and Dr. Roy Wade there, who's done a lot of work with teens around the ACEs. Um, so I'm, I'm not knowing offhand, but I'm wondering if he may have some resources, how to talk to teens about this. Uh, but the visuals for ACEs are really great. There's a lot of them, even if you, like my pulled from Google, right? Google Images has a lot of great ways to explain ACEs visually um, to folks that we can all kind of connect with and say, yeah, I've been there. All right, um, for adults that we work with, sometimes it is difficult to get them to keep their mental health appointments. And sometimes those agencies may refuse to see them due to not keeping their appointments. Mm -hmm. What can you suggest that we can do to encourage them to keep their appointments with dignity and respect and where can we then refer them? <laughs> Aaron, I'm just thinking about everything you just said about how we need to infuse the principles of trauma-informed care into our organizations as well. I think this isn't so much of like a failure of our client to keep their appointments, but a failure of our providers and our own programs, right? When we can't look at like why those barriers exist and what they are. Um, so I would say if you have the opportunity um, to obtain like consent and talk with the providers and really try to dig in and see like why aren't they coming? What are some of those barriers and what can we do as a team to help like address some of those things to get people to their appointments? Um, when we kind of take the responsibility ourselves of like maybe our services aren't as accessible as we thought that they were and how can we help people address that? Um, I also recognize that it's not always possible. Um, so I think being really familiar with resources in the community when you need to pivot and try to find someone who's a little bit more flexible and a little less like traditional sometimes is helpful. Yeah. Um, to piggyback on that one too, I mean, going to therapy or to say, I need to see a therapist or I, I need to consult with a doctor about potential medication is incredibly scary. Um, and also feels like, I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off of this that I've been relying on for such a long time. So, of course, I can see how that would be difficult to want to get into that. The other larger piece is, is that, you know, systemically, a lot of our therapists look just like me, right? So it's really hard when folks are trying to seek somebody that's culturally sensitive um, and also to have somebody that they can connect with look like them. Um, and understand what they've been through. And that's been hard to find. I mean, we're doing a better job of that, um, particularly in the Pittsburgh area. We've got a lot of nice focus on that, but I, I agree with Megan. I think it's, you know, it's a traditional system and there's folks out there that are, are willing to push it. And those are the folks we need to connect with. All right, um, another comment was, thank you for providing this information. Do either of you believe that non-PCP provider relationships are meaningful enough for ACE work? I can see PCP have enough longstanding relationship to address ACEs with the patient and to help them connect and encourage them down this road. Um, PCP by a primary care physician. I might swing it on its head a little bit. Um, I think it's great that everybody has a primary care physician that they can meet with. I think it's important that everybody make sure that they follow up on their health, particularly when we notice what ACEs can do to your health. But I also recognize that that PCP might have a 15 minute visit with somebody. So if you have a great relationship with your PCP, awesome. But I feel like there's room for closer relationships that can be asking these ACE questions as well, in addition to. The more the merrier, I will say. And you might disclose something to a PCP that you wouldn't to another provider, and you might not disclose anything to a PCP where you have your in-home provider significant amount of things. 
Yeah. I think to you, know, even if you're not a provider who would ever give an ACE checklist right to a client and have them complete it, like we can still leverage like what we know from the ACE information to kind of reframe like how we're approaching the people that we're working with, right? And I saw a couple of comments earlier in the chat box about that, that it kind of helps us to see the more complete picture of the individuals that we're working with and also helps us identify some areas where we could work, right, to really promote healing with them. So even if you don't take the ACE checklist like a PCP would and use it, like we can still definitely use some of the knowledge you gain from there. All right, and then I'm gonna take a couple of questions from um, our registration. We had people ask any questions that they had, and um, I think this is a pretty good one that you guys could hit on. How do you present um, this information to parents or grandparents like regarding trauma-informed care? So in my work with children, it's really difficult to help folks recognize that some behaviors are trauma-based and some are behavioral based because they, they, they respond to different interventions. So I often find parents, grandparents come into the door saying, well, nothing works, right? And then getting the history from them and, you know, kind of saying, wow, that was a lot, you know, well, how do you feel like those things have impacted? And a lot of times they may not be making those connections. They recognize that these things have happened or maybe they don't recognize these things as traumas because like we said, trauma's in the eye of the beholder. I might have not had an issue with that, but... I didn't recognize how impactful that was on this child, or I don't have a frame of reference for it. So when we can bridge that gap to say, you know, these things have happened and, you know, what you're noticing is perhaps a trauma related behavior, right? Somebody's trying to tell you what's happened to them and helping them shift that frame to not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you really makes that change. Yeah, I agree. I think having like that space, which Erin, you mentioned earlier, that so many of our parents and caregivers are coming in like with their own toxic stress or their own trauma. So having that space for them on their own to process what it feels like, right, to be caring for a child um, who has very challenging behavior or has trauma um, and giving them their own resources and support around that. Um, but also knowing that we might um, then also need to provide some support around their own histories of trauma. Bingo. I, I give the analogy, thank you for saying that, Megan, because that's so important. I give the analogy to families of, you know, if you have a shaky table leg, one shaky table leg, and you don't address it, all the other table legs are going to get shaky. And we can't just fix that one and expect that everybody else is going to be fine. We have to strengthen all table legs. And by working within the family system, we strengthen all table legs. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so we do have a follow-up question to the, the PCP question. Um, what do you feel is the role healthcare system should play in this work? I mean, outside of the medical provider support and relationships. I, I, I love that question. I'm, you know, we think of medical system as physical health. And I, I just love if we can integrate physical and mental, social, emotional health as something that comes, because we know from these ACEs, long-term ACEs are going to cause health problems, right? We know that. So by making sure that the two aren't mutually exclusive, right? PCPs are checking in about your physical health. Let's check in about your mental health. Let's have that conversation. Personal like, yay. All right. Um, what are some relevant ways to help staff with self-care techniques individually and in groups? Yeah, I'm going to come back to I think something Erin said um, in her presentation, which is something we've been really trying to improve at PAR specifically, um, is providing really intentional space for our workers to process how they feel about the work they, they're doing and how it impacts them. Um, and Erin, when you were talking about the different types of supervision, I think that's exactly where we fall, right? We have clinical supervision, we have admin supervision, 
Um, so we have a new contract um, with a provider who comes in and provides group supervision just around how it feels for our staff to be doing their work. Um, and we also talk a lot about the importance of looking at self-care as a preventative measure, right? And not just, like you said, in a bubble bath when you had a bad day and expecting that to be enough. Um, that really self-care we have to look at holistically and think about having a really realistic like plan embedded into the way that we do our work um, so that it's not just something that we do as we need it. And if you haven't read that book, Trauma Stewardship, I would really recommend that. Like, I just think that's such a helpful way um, to conceptualize how you care for yourself as a worker without just kind of engaging in self-care habits, right? But actually doing some deeper, like, healing work. Um, so Trauma Stewardship is a really good resource for that. Yeah, I think, I think the thing you hit on there, Megan, is, you know, stewardship. And I think coming from agencies, you know, permission. I need permission to build in self-care. I need to know that when I shut that computer down, I'm not required to answer emails at all times of the day now. Like we really need to focus on giving folks the space and the permission um, to have their time. All right, um, and then another question is, what are immediate steps a healthcare provider can take after a positive screen for ACEs? I don't know if I know the answer to that. Um, I think we don't do ACE screening, um, and I don't know that I have talked to enough providers who do it. Um, to do that, but I did just want to say I think that anytime we're talking about screening, whether it's ACEs or for anything else, um, that it is really important to have that connection piece that Erin mentioned, right? That there's a reason that we're screening and it's not just to label people, people's experience as trauma and then tell them all the ways that might have impacted them. Um, so I would hope that if we have providers who are using the more traditional ACE screening, um, that we're doing it with the intent um, of really helping people identify areas where they could use some support Support, and then making those warm referrals and connections to supportive services. I don't know if, Erin, in your work, you might be more familiar with that. Oh, I was just thinking about what a powerful thing for somebody to walk into your office and tell you, right? They know what you're asking on these screeners. That's really, these questions are really open. Have you ever experienced? And I, I feel like if somebody walks in your door and tells you even a little bit, you know, a, a thank you for sharing and how can we get you some extra supports if that's what you would like and I'm going to check up on you and say hey how's it going right just back to um the woman's you know discussion with the the teenager you shared this information and that was a huge step for you and I was lucky enough and to be present there and now I have a responsibility to support you in that and I want to support you in that so yeah, I don't know that I have the right answer. I think that's for everybody else too, but that goes to that, you know, how are we going to plan this out together kind of thing. So thank you for telling me. And, you know, these are some options that may be available. What works for you? All right. Um, there are not any more questions at this time, but feel free to add any questions guys would like or speaking up. Um, I did just want to take this time to mention that um, we do still have copies of The Deepest Well by Nadine Burke Harris. Um, so you, we had a few pickup days, but um, we still have plenty left over. So for anybody on here that attended, you are welcome to stop by the Human Services Center. Um, we're open from like nine to three, Monday through Friday. You will definitely need a mask um, and you'll have to knock or call upon arrival because our door is locked right now. We're not totally open to the public, um, but you're welcome to come by and pick up that book. It's a really powerful book and I definitely recommend um, everybody reading it. We were lucky enough to get um, 100 free copies from the author, so we definitely want to share those with you. Um, and I will give all of that information in a follow-up email as well with our address and the times that you can come pick them up. Um, but feel free to just let me know you're stopping by and we'll be sure to get that to you. 
And I just also wanted to assure you that we have been recording this, so I will send out the recording to everybody, um, as well as the slides and some of the follow-up resources that were mentioned throughout. Um, so you will be getting an email from me sometime this, hopefully tomorrow, <laughs> with all of that follow-up information. Um, but if there are any other questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in. We do have a little bit. I have a question for, for some of you folks. How many of you have experienced reflective supervision within your agencies? How many of you, besides getting like, oh, is your paperwork done? Or this is how you do this when this happens. How many of you have somebody in your office who you say, this is how I feel within the work that I'm doing? Maybe you could, yeah, okay. Angelica's is raising her hand. Yeah, awesome. Great. Great. So that reflective practice is something that's offered to you. And that's so nice to hear. So nice. Great. Any other questions at this time for Aaron or Megan? All right, well, we can go ahead and wrap up early. You guys can have a nice little bathroom break or coffee refill. Um, but I just want to thank you both, Aaron and Megan. This was a really awesome um, presentation and webinar, and you shared a lot of really helpful information with us. So thank you so much for um, doing this with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone, have a good day. Be well.